Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. December 20th, 2017. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show. The Savage Nation. Home of borders, language, culture. And here he is. Winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. Richie Valens. This is Richie Valens, right? Died with a big problem. Don't sing in America. You'll be mistaken for a lunatic. Not like South America where you can sing in a, in a park. This is about the most uptight country on the planet. I've thought about that. As much as I love my country, man, the people are uptight. You can't even say hello to people without them thinking you're nuts. You know how crazy it is to live like that? I mean, people seem like a little looser somewhere south of the uh, of the border. It's not all bad, communist, Marxist, you know, crazy, stupid people. Not everybody living in Ecuador is a communist. Not everybody living in Venezuela, in, in Argentina, is a Nazi uh, sympathizer. What is wrong with people? They don't even travel. They don't know what they're talking about. They were a little looser. That's why the tango developed in, uh, in, uh, in that country. Where do you think the tango came from? It couldn't come from America. Here they did the minuet with false teeth. Anyway, welcome <laughs> to the Savage Nation. I'm trying to loosen you up here on a day like today. Uh, I'm not interested in the tax bill, thank you. If you want to be a booster of the tax bill, be my guest. Call Wallbanger. I'm sure he's going 24-7 how great the tax bill is. That's what he's expected to do. That is what they expect of him. That is what you do uh, when you go to the ninth grade. That's all you can do is uh, sit there and salute uh, Bush when Bush was in the office, then salute Trump when Trump is in office. Nothing wrong with saluting them, but that's not my job. And secondly, I'm already, I got one foot out the door for the holiday. I can feel that my brain is already halfway out the, uh, the microphone. So I started by telling you the midget in Miami story, and I don't know if you want to hear more of those stupid stories, but I can do that if you want. If you really want to get agitated, I can play some Pelosi for you. Yeah, this is so cynical of her to attack the tax cuts because she's one of the richest women on earth. How could she sit there making believe she's one of the poor? So here is, I may as well play it. Um, I, clip four is worth playing just for the comedic elements of it. Here's Nancy Pelosi on the tax bill. This GOP tax scam is simply monumental, brazen theft from the American middle class and from every person who aspires to reach it. The okay. GOP tax scam is not a vote for an investment in growth or jobs. Okay, let's stop. It is a vote it's to... such false tears. One of the richest women in the world is Nancy Pelosi. Lives up there on Pacific Heights, big mansion. Uh, Dianne Feinstein, another great liberal of the poor. You know, I wouldn't mind if she came from the poor or if she was like a Bernie Sanders type using this rhetoric. How can a rich Democrat, who, I mean, one of the richest people on earth for that matter, say things like this and be taken seriously? They can't. That's why they have no no gumption, I mean, no grip, rather, on, on, on reality. Who believes her? So, you know, I played it only for, uh, you know, for effect. See what else is in the bin here. And eh, McConnell, I don't play. No, I don't want to play any of this. Trudeau, that's the guy, the, the, the ballerina from Canada. This guy's crazy altogether. Trudeau, the ballerina from Canada, says ISIS can be a powerful voice in Canada. You've got to listen to clip two from this nut. There's a range of experiences when people come home, and we know that actually someone who has engaged and turned away from that hateful ideology can be an extraordinarily powerful voice for preventing radicalization oh. uh, in uh, future generations oh, and younger uh, younger people within the community now this is an example of liberalism being a mental disorder it wasn't bad enough that he wore ballet tights for many years and then somehow foisted his way on to becoming the prime minister of canada now he's arguing that people who come back from fighting for ISIS can be a powerful voice in Canada. Only a liberal could believe that. 
I would say the firing squad would be a powerful way to solve that problem. You know that they're radical their whole lives. You know that they're never going to accept the ways of life of the average Canadian. You know they'd like to slash your throat. You know they'd like to blow up every church in Canada. Do I have to go down the list, Trudeau? What happened to, to the Canadians? You know, my mother was born in Canada. How could I used to love Canada. How did it become such a stupid country? How? They were tough people. They fought like crazy in World War II. How did the Canadian people get so bamboozled into this? Don't call me. Not interested. Not interested at all in what you think. I mean, on that topic, don't get me wrong. And again, you know, get savage while you can. This is the last radio show of 2017. Normally, I save these for December 31st. I have never done this before. It's almost frightening. It's like I'm jumping off into the unknown. Me, no radio for two weeks, 10 days. Impossible to believe. I do reserve the right to come back on the air, even if there's a fill-in, uh, Jim, if there's a, a world event that needs my wisdom and insights. They'll understand that. I may just call in. I may come on the air, may, make the mic hot wherever I am, go to the studio. I hope not. I'd rather just, you know, not do it. I just want to get away from it all. It's been the toughest year of my life, and I'm not complaining. I, I thank God that I have the ability to have a tough year. How do you like that? Think about what that means. Oh, it was the toughest year of my life. It means I've been engaged in life, more so than ever in my life before. Two best-selling books, and by the way, for those of you who hate me, resent me, and are jealous of me, I am sorry to inform you that one of the most, it's a, it's a dark horse, i got to tell you, God, Faith, and Reason is one of the most unexpected bestsellers of the season. Who would have ever thought that a book about God, Faith, and Reason could make it to the New York Times list, and not only that, Sales of week four are about equal to that of Trump's war, if you can believe it. This is a non-political book. Somebody is buying my views. Somebody is looking into uh, my uh, ancient mystery text. And in this book, which is largely, auto, auto, which is largely auto, autobiographical and highlights from my radio show, I share a series of glimpses of God that I've experienced over the whole of my life before and after I moved into the radio business. And it, it has childhood stories, my dinner with an atheist and a Buddhist, an interview with a Jewish gangster, and my reflections on selected passages from ancient scriptures, or just a few of the electic, eclectic group of experiences and insights that I share in this unique book. And you'll hear about me from my days as a boy growing up in New York City to my many years searching for healing plants in the South Seas to my current incarnation as one of the most popular talk radio hosts in the world. I will tell you this, I've been haunted by glimpses of, glimpses of the divine my whole life, and I've struggled to find their meaning. And I think about God virtually every minute of my life. Do you know that? That's something you just got to take on faith. You just got to take that on faith. Why would I write a book on God, faith, and reason? I could have knocked out another political book and outsold any other book, for example. I didn't. I wanted to do this. Why? You know, I'm forcing to answer them a question of my... My own question on my own show, why did I think it's so important for you to see me struggling with the questions like, does God exist? Why would it matter to me that you care about what I think? I don't know why. I actually don't even have an answer for you. I don't have an immediate answer. I, you know, I mean, I don't have an answer for you. Why would I want to share these things with you? Let me give you a little insight, insider here. I don't think I've told you this. It's worth telling you. I had written approximately 24,000 original words for this book, and I hit a hiatus, a stone wall, somewhere along the line last year. And I said to the publisher, I only have 24,000 words. That's the book. She said, it, it can't be in the book. I cannot do a 24,000-word book in this marketplace. I said, well, that's the size of the painting. Now, if you're an artist, you understand some canvases are bigger than others. Some are even small, but they're still good. But you can't take a small canvas... And make it into a big, a small painting and make it into a big painting. That's just not the way it works. If it's a small painting that you conceived, it's a small painting. It could be fabulous. It could be a Persian miniature, but it's small in size. So I said, no, I can't do it. Now, there's another part of the story. Maybe some of you want to be writers. So I'll share something else with you because I've not done it before. It's the inside story of, of God, Faith, and Reason. And as a writer who's been writing my whole, I've been writing all my, my whole life, period. Forget what anyone may say about it. That's what I've done since I'm a kid. I've always been a writer. But in the beginning, I was an unknown writer. And I wrote poetry. I wrote short plays. I wrote short stories. I wrote short fiction. 
never published. Some of it is absolute garbage. That it, none of it appears. The garbage does not appear in this book. You know, anyone will tell you that you just write and write and write. You hope some of it's good. So then I said to my agent, great guy, Ian Kleinert of Objective Entertainment. He's going to love that plug. Uh, I said, Ian, you know, I can't do anymore. There's no more words here. I said, that's my book. So he said, you know, I've known you through five bestsellers. He said, I've seen some of the writings that no one's ever looked at, like from Buddha to Judah. I've seen your In Search of the Durian Manuscript, which is 600 pages long, about your searching for healing plants in the, in the tropics. And he said, in every page of every one of those books, I see the same storyline as you're searching for God's exi the, the proof that God exists. He said, every plant you ever picked in Fiji or Tonga or Samoa or the Marquesas, Every plant that you collected and sent back to a laboratory was your attempt to find proof that God exists. I said, that's a great insight, Ian. He said, so why don't you go through some of your early manuscripts and try to weave them into one book? Well, that's what I did. And that's where stories that are a little offbeat come from, such as Rabbi in a brothel. That was written as an experiment of a cynical personality living in the San Francisco Bay Area in the 1980s. A man who believed in nothing. A man who had been destroyed, and sh almost destroyed by society. A man who had been pushed aside, shafted, rejected, whose uh, birthright was stolen from him by the social order of the time. And the bitterness is coupled with insights. But in every one of those pages in this book, you're going to see the same theme, which is bouncing off the concept of does God exist? Sure he exists. I'm not sure he exists. Where is he? Why can't I see him? Wait, I see him. There he is. I just saw a baby cry, and I had a tear come to my eyes. Yeah, he exists. Wait a minute. I saw my mother die. I know God exists. Wait a minute. I saw, I saw Henry's, I saw uh, Joe's father being dropped into a graveyard with the Mexican uh, grave diggers coming to tears as the rabbis chanted over the grave. Wait a minute. Hold it. That guy from Israeli intelligence who I didn't even know he knew said to me, we never know where we're going to die. Wait a minute. All of this stuff is in that book. So I'm giving it to you the way it is, which is what's in there. And I'm trying to do it verbally because this show is about verbal. But there's a reason that this book continues to sell with no publicity, with no promotion. And I'm not complaining about it. It's the way of the world. I don't expect anyone to talk about my book. I don't expect Rush Limbaugh to promote my book. I'm not, I'm not, not a member of the cartel. It's the way it works. They have an inside, an in, inside clique. And um, whoever his brother represents is on the good side of him. That's the way it works. It's business. I don't think I violated any, anything I'm not allowed to talk about. Limbo has a wonderful brother, David Limbo, who's an agent. That agent represents three, four major people in talk radio, and they all support each other. That is the way it works. But I'm not on the inside crowd, so I have to do it alone. I'm the outsider, and I've been an outsider my whole life, and I guess that's where God wants me to be, is on the outside uh, looking in, so that's what I do. I don't have any friends in the media, so to speak. I have a few people I talk to who may like me, may not like me, and okay, that's it. But I'm alone in the world. Aren't you alone in the world? Isn't everyone in this radio audience of mine in the same boat as I am in some way or on a different scale, higher, lower? Aren't you alone in the world? Aren't you just a lonely little boat in this vast sea of life? Well, that's the truth. That's what we are. And so sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night in this dark sea. You have no oars. Your rudder is gone. The stars are obliterated by the clouds. And you just don't know where you are or where you're going. Isn't that right? So how do you keep going? What keeps you from panicking in those moments? What gives you the faith to wait until the dawn and to reconstruct the rudder and hope that you can catch some rainwater? What gives you the faith to go on? Well, you can answer that question yourself and write your own book. God, faith, and reason is my answer. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. There is a higher thing in religion, whether it be Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, or even Hinduism. All of it is an attempt to tap into some power. Even paganism, although not one of the five major religions, 
consists of people trying to tap into a power that runs through them through that faith. They want the power. They want the energy. They want to be innervated. They want to feel the power. They don't want to be de-innervated. They don't want to go to a church and come away feeling weaker than when they went in. Every year, people flock to Lourdes in France by the hundreds of thousands. Why? They believe that if they touch the holy water in the grotto of the sanctuary of Our Lady of Lourdes, they will be healed. They believe it can make the crippled walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. Sometimes people will jump up and say, I'm healed, I'm healed. What are they going there for? They're going there for a miracle. What's a miracle? It's the energy, the power that drives the entire universe. It's the energy that makes a blade of grass start from a seed, a dormant dead thing, and turn into a beautiful green thing. That seed is you. That seed is you. Many of us are walking around like a husk, a dead seed. But inside the apparently dead seed, there is a living green piece of grass, just as inside an acorn, there's a great tree. Many of us remain a seed, live our whole lives as a seed, waiting for someone, whether it be a woman or a man, to come along and have that seed sprout. We wait for someone or something to awaken the seed into life and make it come alive, make a piece of green grass or a tree grow from it. People often try to find that through religion. Some do. Some go to church every Sunday. Some go every day. A Sunni Muslim prays five times a day. He believes he's reaching God five times a day. He feels the energy. Have you ever been in St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City on Christmas Eve? Or have you been in an Orthodox Jewish temple in Brooklyn, New York, when there are 5,000 men chanting at the same time? Or even in a village setting where there are 20 men chanting? Have you? Because I have. And if you have, you felt an energy that you will never feel alone. So there is an argument for the congregation, the church, the synagogue, and the mosque. Synagogue and the mosque. These words come from God, faith, and reason. Some call it an inspirational book. I call it my glimpses of God. When I come back, I think I'm going to continue to read some of these inspirational passages and take your calls because it's more interesting to me than taxes. Taxes, you can talk about without thinking about it. It's nothing. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. Well, here's the castle of the savage nation that I've created just for you. I mean, well, maybe the, this is the day to talk about how the savage nation came to be, but there's so much to say, you can't say it all in one day. This show was created to fill the void of the empty world in my own life. This show, The Savage Nation, was a creation of the vacuity of the San Francisco area in particular. This show was created by me to create a um, an audience of like-minded individuals in the airwaves or on the airwaves as a result of the failure of this area that I live in to have human beings who can talk to each other. And I remember a guy I met, good-looking Italian guy, Swiss Italian, blonde hair, blue eyes, one of the guys from the North Beach area I knew casually, I don't remember his name. And I watched him over the years, and I saw him go crazy once. He came up to me in the street and he said, Michael, Michael, there's no continuum here, there's no continuum. And I said to him, what do you mean? He said, you talk to people and they look at you like you're crazy. People don't know how to communicate here. And he eventually left and moved back to Italy, I think. Well, that's basically what happens to people who come here from other places where human beings actually can relate to each other. And, and, and they try to tell a story or they talk to a stranger and they look at like they're crazy. So I never moved my mother out here, by the way. I remember when she was older, I thought of moving her out here. But I knew she'd never fit in because she was a, a, a talker, a schmoozer. She would talk to strangers. And if she did that here... Even women of her same age group, of her same religious religion, they would have treated her like a, like a freak because she talked to people. In other words, she knew how to reach them. Out here, it's like a zombie, a zombie job. So that's, the, that's how it is. Once I uh, talked about an amulet. In fact, I write about the amulet in God, Faith, and Reason. And I, t I told the story of the amulet. 
And you say, well, I don't believe in amulets. That's not Christian. That's not Jewish. Well, actually, it's a Jewish amulet. And Catholics in America had little plastic statues of St. Christopher in their cars. And then the statues gave way to dream catchers. That was the end of America as far as I knew it. Those St. Christopher statues in cars in New York of my childhood were icon effigies that Catholics had. Didn't make them less Catholic, did it? What about wearing a cross? Is that not a sort of amulet? A protection against evil? It certainly is. And so when I talk to you about an amulet that I found in an antique store in Israel, it's very much along those lines. So I end that little insert in, uh, in my book with a story of a very mystical rabbi, a very intelligent man, and, I wrote, and I'll read it to you. It's less than a page. One day I called a rabbi known for mysticism, and I said, I need to meet some rabbis who are into mysticism. I told him some problems I was having in my life, and I asked him to do something for me. He said, no, no, Michael. You're so powerful. You're the rabbi. You have to do it for yourself. He said, you speak to God. Well, not long ago, I called him again. He was so excited to hear from me. I had sent him an email picture of the amulet for him to translate the Hebrew. He said to me, Michael, listen to what is written on the amulet in Hebrew. It's the blessing of Joseph. It says, you are my son, and the evil eye cannot hurt you. You are like the fish, and no evil eye can get to you. If you believe in God, no evil eye can touch you. When you get conceited, the evil eye can touch you. He also said, tell all your listeners today that if they have had luck in their life, good luck, and they're rich, or they're wealthy, or they're doing well, to watch out for conceit. The minute they are filled with conceit, the evil eye will touch them. He continued, this is the most important thing that I have to tell you, Michael, because it so happens that what you told me today about the amulet is by coincidence, Michael, the exact weekly portion of the Torah to Jewish people, passage 4922, Blessings of Joseph. Don't flaunt your wealth or people will be jealous of you. You are my son and the evil eye cannot hurt you. You are like the fish and no evil eye can get you. Play some music. Um, Jim, just give me some spiritual music, any good fast music, because if I was in a setting with a bunch of guys drinking vodka right now, that would be called a Febringen, and everybody would pound the table and lift a glass of vodka and drink it right now. But since I'm not in a setting with a bottle of vodka and a pounding ta a table I can pound, and that's all. Play that's good enough. I'm uh, giving it all, my friends. I'm giving it to you all. It's uh, the holidays and I'm selling the house. If a man's body and mind are under control, he should give evidence of it in virtuous deeds. This is a sacred duty. Faith will then be his wealth. Sincerity will give his life a sweet savor. And to accumulate virtues will be his sacred task. Who wrote that? It's in Buddha. So what did I do? I found this a similar saying in the Jewish writings. Ben Zoma said, who is wise? He who learns from all men. Who is mighty? He who subdues his passions. Who is rich? He who rejoices in his portion. Who is worthy of honor? He who respects his fellow man. Hillel, one of my favorite teachers, used to say, An empty-handed man cannot be a sin-fearing man, nor can an ignorant person be truly pious, nor can the diffident learn, nor the passionate teach, nor is everyone who excels in business wise, in a place where there are no men strive to be a man. So why am I reading this to you? It's to show you that across all religions, similar sayings have been written by wise men, whether they be Buddhists or Jewish or Christian. And I tried to find the connectivity between the wisdom of the, of the people on the earth, of the wise people on the earth, as opposed to selling a religion. It's that simple. So it's all in there. What's this one? A covenant with all the ills in the world? I don't know if I want to read any more of this to you. It's all beautiful stuff. The Buddhism part was interesting. Oh, I remember where this came from. I had written a book, a short book, in 1982 that nobody wanted to publish. And it was entitled, From Buddha to Judah. And actually, it was from Judah to Buddha, or Buddha to Judah, whatever it was. And it was a time when a lot of people were experimenting, Western people thought that they were Buddhists. And you see it today, you know, a lot of fallen Catholics think they're Buddhists. But they don't really understand Buddhism, in my estimation. In, and the reason I say that is because true Buddhists laugh at them, in that they ape Buddhists in their practice of Buddhism without even understanding what the, what they're kind of you know pretending to be. So I um, investigated these roads, 
and it was written quite a while ago. As I say, boy, it was a long time ago. And it starts with my conversation about a 60-year-old tennis player who looked better than most 40-year-olds. He was also a psychiatrist. He's a tennis player. He was also a rabbi. He was a learned rabbi, trained psychologist, and he didn't exhibit the binds or trapping of either role, choosing instead the easy grace of master tennis instructor. He was a Zen master in that regard. He was a great guy. He passed. I looked him up recently after I wrote this book. I found that the, uh, he had recently passed away. I lost touch with him. You know, that's what life is all about, is that sometimes along the road you meet people, wonderful people, and they come in your life and your friends, and with the flux of our society, moved away. I never kept in touch with him. And I looked him up, and I found out he passed away a number of years ago. So I wrote about great guy, wonderful man. And um, the fact is, the writings in uh, in these religions cross over in many ways. And and I try to incorporate that. It's from tennis to temples, tempest, a, co a covenant with all the ills of the world. Here's a nice one. I had long known God as a vengeful God. I write. One who judged according to his laws, allowing no mercy. That, those are my words. Nothing occurs on this earth that is not somehow related to behavior in this world or the world of our comic past. That's a heavy statement. I had long known God as a vengeful God. Many people don't want to hear that. Christians don't believe God is vengeful. They believe God is benevolent. benevolent. I'm not so sure of that. I believe my God is a vengeful God. That's all I can say to you. You know, and my view of the world is, is that the Jewish teaching regarding cause and effect that I read as a child went something like this. Rabbi Hanaya wrote, they that are born are destined to die and the dead to be brought to life again and the living to be judged, to know, to make known and to be made conscious that he is God. He the maker, he the creator, he the discerner, he the judge, he the witness, he the complainant. He is that will and future judge. Blessed be he with whom there is no unrighteousness, nor forgetfulness, nor respect of persons, nor taking of bribes. Know also that everything is according to the reckoning. And let not thy imagination give thee hope that the grave will be a place of refuge for thee. For perforce thou wilt in the future have to give account and reckoning before the supreme king of kings, the holy one. That's a pretty heavy duty, vengeful God statement, is it? In other words, man, there's no way out. I don't care which way you twist on the hook. You are not getting out of here in a nice way. No, no matter what you do, no matter how you play it, that's it. <laughs> that's the whole story. So, you know, when you hit that reality point in your life, it can freak people out. They can really go to pieces. You start thinking about that. What am I just actually said there? Let not thy imagination give thee hope that the grave will be a place of refuge for thee. You will have in the future to give an account and reckoning before the Supreme King of Kings, the Holy One. The only way out of that one is to become an unbeliever in anything. So, oh, that's a bunch of crap. There's no, there's no life after death. There's no God. There's no judgment day. Well, my answer to that one is quite simple. I'm gambling there is. You're gambling there isn't. And so if I'm right, and I try to play it the best I can for that judgment day, I hope God will recognize I tried to play it the best I can for that judgment day. While you who say there is no God and no judgment day, you may be a decent person, but you may not be a decent person. You could be an absolute evil person who thinks that you, you can get away, anything you can get away with is okay because you're not going to be judged for it, that unless you're caught and punished by the law in your lifetime. But what if you gamble that there is no judgment day and there is no God and you're wrong? Well, you can't make it up. You can't go back to the classroom and start all over again. There's no doing this one over again. I don't know whether there's reincarnation. How would I know that? How would I really know that? I have inklings of it. You see, God, faith, and reason, right? I, by the way, I'm sorry to be so, like, spiritually, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just giving it to you. I don't even know. I didn't even plan on doing this today. But it is my last day of broadcasting for 2017, so far as I know. And we don't know what tomorrow will bring. I don't know whether there's, I don't know what tomorrow will bring. Let's leave it at that. I don't want to be overly dramatic and melodramatic. So I'm trying to give you someone from the heart here. I'm trying to say to you that underneath, underneath this voice that you hear every day, the voice that you've come to love for politics, for humor, for sarcasm, 
the ups and the downs that we've been through together. This is what really plays underneath it all. This is the undercurrent of that man's voice that you listen to. And I'm giving it to you so you understand the undertow and the undercurrents so you can better understand the waves. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Welcome back to the Savage Nation. You know I've never before endorsed a pain reliever. You know that for a fact, but I do endorse relief factor because I have studied and even written about the four ingredients uh, that it's made from. And you ask, well, who should consider ordering relief factor? I would say anyone with pain that's keeping them from doing things that bring joy to their life, like taking walks without pain, riding a bike or playing golf without pain, even getting out of bed every morning without pain. And of course, there are no guarantees. I understand that. But I know you could very possibly be helped, like the thousands of other listeners who have been helped, simply by ordering the three-week quick start from Relief Factor for just nineteen ninety-five, And if 20 bucks is too much for you, then you must not be in much pain. But if pain is keeping you from doing the things you love to do, a $20 investment to see if you, if you can lower or eliminate your pain is not really that much at all. It's simple. Try the three-week quick start only at relieffactor.com. I haven't taken many calls today. I got loads of calls up there, and I want to take all of them. I'll be here for another hour. Some of you leave the show now in some markets, unfortunately, because of the wisdom of the marketplace. Uh, you only get two hours of my wisdom, and then it's followed by even greater wisdom. And so, therefore, uh, you, you'll be leaving me shortly, and I'll see you on the other side of the calendar, I hope. <laughs> and uh, it's been a great year. It's been filled with a lot of laughs, great moments. And uh, this is a great, great holiday year for most of us. When you think about it, it's actually a great time to be in America, despite all the complaining and belly aching. I mean, the country's fundamentally at peace. The economy is, is doing well for most people. I know the rich have never been richer. Okay, got it. But by and large, the economy is doing well for everybody. And you'll hear a lot of belly aching. But those doing the most belly aching are usually millionaires in the media or millionaires in the Democrat Party who are pretending that they're one of the poor, you know, like a Nancy Pelosi on the Hill. She's hurting. Yeah, she's hurting. She's hurting because of the economy. She never had it so good. So, you know, by and large, look in your own. No one's starving in the country. Everyone's fat and happy. It's the freest country the world has ever seen. You can practice any religion, no religion. You could be an atheist. You could be a monotheist. You could be a no-theist. It doesn't matter what you do in this country. That's the beauty of it. No one can come and tell you what to do or not to do. That makes this a great country. It also causes a lot of strife, but that's what comes with freedom. Freedom and strife are our cousins. So it's been a great year for me. As I say, a very hard year in terms of work, but that's a mark of good. That's a mark of a good thing. In other words, what would an easy year look like? It would mean I wasn't striving for anything. But in striving, there's difficulty. And in overcoming the difficulties, you achieve things. So, yeah, it's been a hard year and a good year. Trump's war came out in, um, I think, February of last year. It became number one on the New York Times. And I just checked my calendar. I met Donald Trump last February uh, at Mar-a-Lago, where I had 90 minutes with him over ice cream. That was a fun night, a really big night in my life. And then... Um, I was attacked viciously by an unknown assailant, not shortly thereafter, that made worldwide news around the, around the same time, as a matter of fact, which was, uh, I don't know if it was coincidental, but I saw a very good person step in as well. Teddy survived it. He's doing fine. I survived it. I'm doing fine. And so here it is now, God, Faith, and Reason, New York Times bestseller. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. December 20th, 2017. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity, 
Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. Death and taxes. I'll leave that to Ben Franklin and the others in the media because I'm not talking about taxes. Actually, maybe I'm talking about death, not taxes, now that I think about it. Franklin said that the only sure things in life are death and taxes, and I'll leave the others who can't talk about death to talk about taxes. Uh, but since I've written God, Faith, and Reason, and everything surrounding God has to do with life and death, I guess I am talking about the other side of Ben Franklin's uh, observation. So if you care to join the conversation, the phone number is 855-400-7282, 855-400-SAVAGE. Again, uh, this is the last show of nine of twenty almost said nineteen seventeen of twenty seventeen on the Savage Nation because I'm going on vacation starting tomorrow. I am, I am, I am moving over Miami. Jam down there I hear because the uh Caribbean got blown out by the storms. Miami's booming, it's such a boom, it's a nightmare. South Florida people who would go to St. Bart's or NASA they're not going. They're going to Miami, so Miami's busier than ever. The roads will be jammed, so what do I care? I'm gonna do a lot of my own stuff. I'm not going to be on the radio unless there is a national or world event that requires my insights uh, and analysis. Then I, I will come back. Uh, from time to time, if you follow me on Twitter, I may pop up on Periscope, maybe on a beach, maybe not on a beach, maybe on a boat, maybe not on a boat, maybe fishing, maybe not fishing, maybe on a bicycle, maybe not bicycle, maybe in a restaurant, maybe not in a restaurant. But other than that, you know, I, I just need a, a complete and total break from it all. So let's go to the callers on the Savage Nation. The phone number, again, is, well, there's no, no lines open. What's the point of giving you the phone number? I will mention that you can get the free newsletter on michaelsavage.com. It's a good deal because it costs you nothing. It's a great deal. Where do you sign up for that? I don't even know where she put it. I don't know where it is. The newsletter's on the right there. And if you want to sign up for the Savage Nation newsletter, you give the email address and you get a free subscription. What could be better? That's all. Okay, now let's take some callers. Casey on KLIF Radio in the great city of Dallas, Texas. Welcome to the program. How you doing? Uh, thanks for taking my call. I'm, I want to comment about the other day you were talking about uh, uh, ceremony, the anniversary of your mother's passing and you also mentioned about people getting depressed at this time of year. I don't know if you remember, but I did send a condolence card to you. I believe it was a Florida address. I was in a federal prison at the time in Dallas, Texas, when your mother passed away. And your expressing it on the radio made me feel sympathetic. And I, I honestly... That's a that's an unusual feeling for me. You talk about people being depressed at this time of year, also at holidays, and mm -hmm. I've experienced that. And maybe it's due to the the lifestyle that I chose to live, where I disassociated myself from all these type of things, due to the fact of uh, you know being incarcerated many many years of my life. I think what you're saying though is somehow were you listening to the show while you were in prison? Oh yeah, constantly. I bought all your books. Yeah, I listened all the time. That's amazing. I didn't. I honestly didn't know that they let you listen to radio in prisons. I have no idea what the rules are, and I, I'm glad to hear you can listen to radio. Maybe the, the only lifeline people have in these places would be a, a, a radio. I mean, TV would be fun also to get your mind off things by watching a movie. But there's no. I don't think there's any emotional connectivity with it with a person on television by and large, right? No, I didn't watch the TV. Was a bit, the TV was a bunch of political drama uh, as far as the inmate politics of what channel was going to be. Oh, God, I can't imagine. There must have been fights over what to watch. So, All oh, right, yeah. so what, you're, you're allowed to have a, like a little transistor radio in a prison cell? Yeah, a little AM, FM, little Walkman uh, battery. Wow, I'm pretty amazing. All right, so you choose any radio, any, uh, so you could choose any, any uh, talk show, music, whatever you want. So let me go back for a minute. You're saying my mother passed away. I think it was in what year was that, 2012? I don't remember. No, uh, it, it's a blank. Was it 2000? And this is 17, like 2004, 5. Do you remember the year? 
Yeah, it was 2003 or 2004 because I was in Siegelville, FCI Siegelville in Dallas, Texas. What was your What was your crime? Uh, felon uh, firearm charges. Felon in possession of firearm. They gave me ten years. Oh wow, that's a big sentence for a for a firearm. Well, that's a it big big your sentence. Criminal history is. All right, so look, you're a troubled guy. You've been in and out of prison. You've had trouble with the law your whole life. But what you're saying is. My announcing my mother's passing in that year touched you? Is that what you're saying? It did, because I personally also experienced my mother's death when I was 12. But I was, for some reason, you, you, you block these emotions out or you block these feelings out. And when I heard you talking about your mother passing away on the radio, the realization of I've experienced that same same thing you know it just made me angry when i was a young kid when my mother died i just became mm. angry angry mm. at the world mm. interesting well you know what what i'm learning from this call casey is that we never know who's listening to our show we can easily assume we know and we have some image in our head of at quote an audience but we don't really know when you consider it's mass communications and there are millions of people who listen to a show such as this one uh, you know, you don't know who's listening or where they are. You know, you're one of many, and you were touched in one way. Others maybe you've touched in another. So I, I don't know what to say to this call other than I'm actually gratified that I was able to reach you and maybe unlock some of those emotions for you. You did, and it even goes beyond that. You taught me things about patriotism that I didn't. I didn't have. And I didn't recognize... I understand. It's very hard to love a country that you've had trouble with. It's very hard to love a country that puts you in prison, even in prison, even though you know that you deserve prison. You still wind up hating the, the system, right? I mean, that's the way it would be. Yeah, yeah it is. But, I, I, you know, you, you're just mad because you got caught. But, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying... <laughs> no, no, I understand. But it's hard to go from being a, 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 a criminal to being, like, a patriot all of a sudden. I, you know, I know that as well. I think patriotism is is something you have to learn, and I believe that's why the left in America goes out of their way to debase the country and, of course, to expunge all of our education of any love for this nation, it, it, because by disconnecting people from their nation, they can then mold that person into a, quote, world citizen easily uh, made into a vessel of their of their own making. So... Well, thank you. It's been an interesting conversation. I hope you'll appreciate the copy of God, Faith, and Reason if you'll stay on the line. Uh, he will take your address. That's an amazing once-in-a-lifetime call, i got to tell you. Maggie on KSFO, you're next up on the Savage Nation. Maggie, what's on your mind? Hi, Michael. Um, I want to say thank you um, for suffer. Um, I, I, first off, I remember the day I was when you said you were going to write this book or when you announced it last year. I was mm. over by the Stonestown Mall. Mm -hmm. So I remember it well. Um, but what I want to tell you is I'm a child uh, who was caught up in the pedophilia that happened in the Catholic Church that con continues to happen. Um, and what that did to me and how it destroyed me as a human being for a long, long time, the vision that that priest left in my mind of who God was destroyed well, wait, you're, you're, a, you're a woman who was molested by a priest? Yes, at the age of five. Uh, a priest molested a, gir a girl, in other words. That's what you're saying. Yes. Oh, yes. And that, but, but what, people don't, I don't think, understand. I was a little girl, and that vision that it stuck with me until I was like 55 years old of who God was, it destroyed me. It's a horrific vision that a lot of us share. That went Well, I, I can't relate to it in that way, because it's probably the worst thing that could ever happen to a person is to be molested as, as a child. And it, it does destroy the person for life, which is why the, there's almost no punishment on earth to take away. When you take away a child's innocence, it cannot be returned. That's also a fact of reality. So that priest stole your life from you. He did. But, Michael, this is the thing that when I went and bowed down in just total, I was done. And I wanted to leave. I didn't want to be here anymore. And I reached out to a god that was really ugly to me for a long time, and he came down to me. And he, this is, 
how he brought me through it, and he continues to bring me through it. So please listen to the others that are out there who have suffered with this. He had me go back to church. He had me quit taking the Eucharist in my hand, and he said, please let me feed this to you. So he caused me to make the church stick to its commitment on those sanctified hands of the priest that become Jesus' hands, and he placed it on my tongue, and every Now, wait a minute. Hold on. Who, who placed it on your tongue? The, a priest placed the, the, the Eucharist on my tongue. Wait, wait. You're, you're confusing me. You said that a priest molested you, and then you said you were ready to quit life, and then God came down to you, and he did what? He had another priest touch you in a positive way with the Eucharist? Is that what you're saying? He, Jesus himself... The priest's hands are sanctified. I understand. What are you saying? Jesus came down himself and, and, and touched you? And touched me. And he used... What, what did Jesus look like? What did Jesus... Wait, stop. What did Jesus look like? Jesus... Okay, this is the part where I don't... I can't tell you what Jesus looked like. What he had me do was go back to the church that tried to destroy me. And he himself, through the priest... The hands that Jesus Christ sanctifies through the Holy Spirit had that priest place that Eucharist on my tongue. And I, everything changed for me. because The same, the same priest who had molested you? Oh, no. No, no. This was a priest. This was a man of God. Those okay, okay. So you then went back and had the good man of God uh, bring you to Jesus. I get it. Maggie, thank you for that amazing story. I appreciate that. I'm going to take one more quick call here and then take a break, and then we're going to go back to other topics on the program. Margie on KSFO. Fire away uh, on the Savage Nation, please. Good afternoon, Dr. Savage. I just wanted to tell you, actually, it was just an accommodation call. I know that this is your last, uh, your last show before Christmas. And I wanted you to take this thought with you and enjoy your holidays or whatever you refer to it as. I want to let you know that I, I, I vote Democratic only because I, um, this, my family all has been, you know, from I don't know how long. But I, after listening to your program this last few months, I realized that I'm not sure what I really am. I believe a lot of what the, you know, the Democratic process the democratic um, ways, mm -hmm. but also I feel like maybe I am far conservative as well, maybe half liberal and half conservative. But what that, I, that would make you an average American, because most Americans are split in their, in their uh, politics, by the way, especially today, Margie. So I'm glad that you were able to crystallize your own political identity by listening to talk radio, and I want to thank you for doing that, and I'm going to send you a copy of God, Faith, and Reason. Perhaps that will help you crystallize some of your beliefs. I shall return in a moment on the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. It is 31 minutes after the carrot on the Savage Nation. Here's an odd story. Alien mineral found at site of 60 million year old meteor strike. Now, I avoid UFO stories. I avoid all ET stories. I don't do it. It's the third rail of radio. But this is an interesting one because it's based on science. Scientists have discovered alien minerals at the site of a prehistoric meteor strike on Scotland's remote Isle of Skye. Geologists uh, were part of a team examining volcanic rocks on sky when they spotted mineral forms from a meteor impact that have never been found on Earth before. They published the findings in the journal Geoscience World. Specifically, the scientists found Osbornite, which had previously been collected as space dust on a NASA mission. Now, initially, the scientists thought they were looking at a volcanic flow deposit called ignimbrite. But when they used an electron microprobe, they found the rare space material. When we discovered what it was, we were very surprised, and it was a bit of a shock because we were not expecting that, said Electra at the Department of Earth Sciences. The researchers were examining the base of a 60-million-year-old lava flow when they discovered the Osbornite. 
And because the mineral form was unmelted, it's likely to be an original piece of the meteorite, according to the geologists. So what does it have to do with us? Well, the finding raises questions about where the meteorite hit and whether its impact triggered an outpouring of volcanic lava that started at the same time. But a second site, 4.3 miles away, also revealed the same unusual mineral makeup in what is known as ejecta, material ejected from a crater. Well, what can I say? Do I really know? It's all over the news now about UFOs and Air Force pilots who claim to have seen unidentified flying objects, Defense Department running whole programs on this, claiming that there are aliens amongst us. I don't, need, I don't need a science to tell me there are aliens amongst us. I've lived in the Bay Area long enough to tell you I know it for a fact. I don't need a science to tell me that they're cyborgs. I know it. They may look like people, but they're not. That's what I meant by no continuum. That's what I meant by why I created the Savage Nation. That's why I meant why I stay here. Because it's fun to uh, live around aliens. It's fun to walk in the streets and see people look human and almost talk like human, but they're really not human. They're Bay Areaites. In that sense, they're half human. And so it's a pleasure to be around such people because they don't bother me. They leave me alone. They're rather benign. That's all I can tell you. I've lived around aliens my entire life. And more or less, they're benign people. They don't bother anybody. They just don't bother anybody. They just fill each other with psychobabble about how good they are and how you have to help the poor and the homeless and the illegal alien uh, without thinking through what that actually means. Well, that's my opinion, so I don't know what this meteorite really means in terms of the fact that the alien mineral found at the site of a 60 million year old meteor strike is an alien mineral. What does it actually, what does it actually mean? And what if there is life outside of Earth or in another universe? So what would that matter to us? How would that change anything? What would it matter if there's life somewhere else? Why would it matter to us? You know, what are they waiting for? Can't they come down for Christmas and visit us? Maybe the original Santa Claus who came down the chimney was an alien. How do we know he wasn't? Maybe he comes from a North Pole. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. This is not supposed to be an arm of the government. The media is not supposed to be an arm of any government, whether it's Obama's government or Trump's government. That's not our job. But anyway, this is the miracle of talk radio, and I think I will um, defer to the audience, which is the only guarantee in life is that the Savage Nation is on right now, and that you have an opportunity to call 855-47282 and call in your request, whatever you want. And while you're doing that, I, I don't know if I should tell you about the midget in the Miami Beach Hotel. How many people want to hear about the midget? Jim, there's only two people. Clint, do you want to hear about the midget or not? Clint's busy screening calls. Jim, both guys, they're my only audience, say yes. They said they'd rather hear about the midget in the Miami Beach Hotel uh, than Trump speaking about the tax bill. I and mean, what's there to hear? We know we have passed the bill. Great. The world is a better place. All of the sycophants in the media who hated him last year and now love him will be licking uh, the, the black polish off his boots tonight. What is there to be happy about with the tax bill? Tell me. Do you know actually what it's going to do for you? Nothing. We'll, let, we'll see how much of it trickles down. It's a trickle-down economy model. The assumption is, is that if AT&T and Verizon do well, you'll do well. Okay, let's wait and see how much of it trickles down. That's all. I had enough already. I, I mean... I'm glad he did it. I'm glad the big corporations are going to be rolling in uh, in money like never before in their life. I'm glad that the major corporations had the biggest win of their uh, of their dreams. I'm so glad you have no idea. I'm glad in a way you could never imagine. This is so wonderful that big business has benefited because as you well know to conservatives big business is America. To conservatives, what's good for big business is good for America. It doesn't matter if people uh, will starve to death in some, some quarters of America. That doesn't matter. What matters is that their bosses in big, big business are happy. Therefore, they're happy. Now, you can wrap yourself in the Constitution. You can wrap yourself in the American flag. But there's more to the tax bill than meets the eye. And the fact is, what about the families? Will a tax bill help families? Okay, so the tax bill, you'll hear about it all day long tonight. That's all you'll hear about. It's better than anything. In fact, it's better than George Washington. 
It's better than the Battle of uh, Gettysburg. This tax bill is better than the Revolutionary War victory over the British. It's better than defeating the Nazis. It is uh, superior to the Korean War in many ways. It beats the uh, bombing run over Schweinfurth. That's what you're going to hear by the end of the day. How much can you take of it? We know it's an historic tax bill. We know that the Islamic State has been destroyed. We know that there's 1.7 million new jobs. We know we have the lowest unemployment rate in 17 years. We know excessive regulations have been rolled back. We know that we have 60 record highs in the stock market. All well and good, but that's not my job. I am a talk show host. I'm not an arm of the government. Are you? Uh, everyone's celebrating the uh, tax cuts, I guess. That's a big story. But how do you celebrate it on the radio? I, first of all, I'm going to pay more, so I'm not celebrating. I live in California. I voted for Trump. I'm paying more. So you want me to celebrate? I don't live anywhere else. They're eliminating my state tax deduction, as well as everyone in New York State who actually earns a living is going to pay more. Even those who voted for Trump will pay more. It is the stupidest thing on earth to say, well, well, that's a product of your state. You should complain to your state. Yeah, okay. Sophomoric is too high a compliment to a statement like that. There would be someone who doesn't even know what a sophomore is. So I'm not going to you know, celebrate. What's, what's to celebrate? I'm not AT&T. Market will roar more, says Cohn. Well, that's Goldman Sachs. What are they going to say? It's going to go down? Here's an odd one. MSNBC top CNN in full year viewership. Drudge Report. Why would MSNBC suddenly be surging? Answer, because there are so many left-wingers in the country now. There are more, let us say, people on the left than there ever have been because of Trump. Rightly or wrongly, it doesn't matter whether you agree with that statement or not, there are more leftists than ever. More people have moved over to the Bernie Sanders side of things than ever, for whatever the reasons are. The polarization has never been greater in my lifetime. And so there's more, and they're still watching the... the um, more snotty nonsense by uh, commies on, on whatever it is. I'm not going to join the throng now and make up stupid statements about them. I don't, I don't watch the channel. I don't find them int interesting or entertaining. I don't watch CNN. I don't watch Fox. I don't watch cable news at all. Any, if I watch news at all, if I watch it at all and I don't, if I'm bored out of my mind and I don't, there's not a good car show or uh, Hitler doesn't get killed again on history or naked and afraid, or a good movie like The Bad and the Beautiful with Kirk Douglas. Oh, what a movie last night on T Turner Classic Movies, TCM. What a, I loved it. I loved noir films. I watched The Bad and the Beautiful with uh, Kirk Douglas, 1952. He plays a ruthless producer who claws his way to the top and uses everyone along the way and then throws them out the minute he's through using them, including someone he stole a script from. What a story. So well done. Lana Turner. I didn't know she was that great. I had no idea who she was because I never paid attention to the stars of those days. But that woman had it all. She had a vulnerability to her sensuality and uh, an almost a pathos that she projected with her being. you got to see that movie. But uh, no, so if I, don't, if I don't see a good movie or a military history show or I'm watching TV, I just want to, like, space out, I go to 103 on my cable channel, which is... Um, the RT, RT. And I can, I, can I can read between propaganda, whether it's from Russia or the United States. So the reason I watch it is that the girls are not all blonde. They don't wear form-fitting sweaters. They actually can speak four languages. And they're super literate and articulate, the newscasters. It's a phenomenon to watch intelligent women, given the vacuity of the media in America, where it's all about a striptease posing as newscasters, by and large. So I don't watch the news, you know, I don't know. But I hear MSNBC is doing better than CNN. What does that tell you? More people have moved to the left than ever because of Donald Trump. That's a statement. It's a statement of fact rather than a comment on the fact. If you really want to get agitated, I can play some Pelosi for you. This is so cynical of her to attack the tax cuts because she's one of the richest women on earth. How could she sit there making believe she's one of the poor? So here is, I may as well play it. Um... I, clip four is worth playing just for the comedic elements of it. Here's Nancy Pelosi on the tax bill. This GOP tax scam is simply monumental, brazen theft from the American middle class 
and from every person who aspires to reach it. Oh, please. The GOP tax scam is not a vote for an investment in growth or jobs. Okay, let's stop. It's such false tears. One of the richest women in the world is Nancy Pelosi. Lives up there on Pacific Heights, big mansion. Uh, Diane Feinstein, another great liberal of the poor. You know, I wouldn't mind if she came from the poor or if she was like a Bernie Sanders type using this rhetoric. How can a rich Democrat who, I mean, one of the richest people on earth for that matter, say things like this and be taken seriously? They can't. That's why they have no no gumption, I mean, no grip, rather, on, on, on reality. Who believes her? So, you know, I played it only for, uh, you know, for effect. See what else is in the bin here. And eh, McConnell, I don't play. No, I don't want to play any of this. We know the tax bill. Here's a, here's a story that's worth talking about. Mistrial in Bundy case, latest blow to prosecutors in long-running case. That's a good story. The, the Texas Bundy job. Mistrial. That's good. Now, this I don't know whether to believe. North Korea testing anthrax ICBM payload, says a report. You know, if he's that evil, it's time to whack him. It's that simple. I don't know what we're waiting for. What are we waiting for? Till anthrax hits L.A.? North Korea's beginning tests on mounting anthrax onto intercontinental ballistic missiles that would strike the U.S. report said on Wednesday, just two days. Do I know if this guy is really do, do, doing this? Japan's Asahi newspaper reported. Oh, they're reporting. Well, okay, look. We don't know whether to believe this. Japan is terrified, of, and rightly so, of the North Korean lunatic. They would like us to st strike North Korea to protect them. So they're putting out what I think is propaganda. North Korea has started experiments such as heat and pressure equipment to prevent anthrax from dying even at a high temperature of over 7,000 degrees generated at the time of ICBMs re-entering the energy of the report. Stated in part, there is unconfirmed information that has already succeeded in such experiments. I don't believe it. I don't believe it at all. And I believe it's Japan, rightly so, terrified of the hermit kingdom. And maybe it'll turn out South Korea's long suspected North Korea is developing biological weapons. It's possible. So what are we waiting for then? What are we waiting for? Jung's Kim Jong mentally ill on scientists launched its greatest ICBM in November that they said could carry a super heavy nuclear warhead that could strike the whole mainland of the U.S. Well, what are we waiting for? Trudeau, that's the guy, the, the, the ballerina from Canada. This guy's crazy altogether. Trudeau, the ballerina from Canada, says ISIS can be a powerful voice in Canada. You've got to listen to clip two from this nut. There's a range of experiences when people come home, and we know that actually someone who has engaged and turned away from that hateful ideology can be an extraordinarily powerful voice for preventing radicalization oh. uh, in uh, future generations oh, and younger uh, younger people within the community now this is an example of liberalism being a mental disorder it wasn't bad enough that he wore ballet tights for many years and then somehow foisted his way on to becoming the prime minister of canada now he's arguing that people who come back from fighting for ISIS can be a powerful voice in Canada. Only a liberal could believe that. I would say the firing squad would be a powerful way to solve that problem. You know that they're radical their whole lives. You know that they're never going to accept the ways of life of the average Canadian. You know they'd like to slash your throat. You know they'd like to blow up every church in Canada. Do I have to go down the list, Trudeau? What happened to... To the Canadians. You know, my mother was born in Canada. How could... I used to love Canada. How did it become such a stupid country? How? They were tough people. They fought like crazy in World War II. How did the Canadian people get so bamboozled into this? Don't call me. Not interested. Not interested at all in what you think. I mean, on that topic, don't get me wrong. There is a higher thing in religion, whether it be Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, or even Hinduism. All of it is an attempt to tap into some power. Even paganism, although not one of the five major religions, consists of people trying to tap into a power that runs through them, through that faith. They want the power. They want the energy. They want to be innervated. They want to feel the power. They don't want to be de-innervated. They don't want to go to a church and come away feeling weaker than when they went in. Every year, people flock to Lourdes in France by the hundreds of thousands. Why? They believe that if they touch the holy water in the grotto of the sanctuary of Our Lady of Lourdes, they will be healed. 
they believe it can make the crippled walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. Sometimes people will jump up and say, I'm healed, I'm healed. What are they going there for? They're going there for a miracle. What's a miracle? It's the energy, the power that drives the entire universe. It's the energy that makes a blade of grass start from a seed, a dormant dead thing and turn into a beautiful green thing. That seed is you. That seed is you. Many of us are walking around like a husk, a dead seed. But inside the apparently dead seed, there is a living green piece of grass, just as inside an acorn, there's a great tree. Many of us remain a seed, live our whole lives as a seed, waiting for someone, whether it be a woman or a man, to come along and have that seed sprout. We wait for someone or something to awaken the seed into life and make it come alive. Make a piece of green grass or a tree grow from it. People often try to find that through religion. Some do. Some go to church every Sunday. Some go every day. These words come from God, faith, and reason. Some call it an inspirational book. I call it my glimpses of God. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. In other words, it was a time like today. Welcome back to the Savage Nation. And as we cruise into the last three minutes of the show, which is the last show of 2017, I'm going to go to michaelsavage.com, home of the Savage Nation, borders, language, and culture. Again, you can sign up for the newsletter. It's free. It arrives in your inbox a couple of times a week. So here's what I have on my website today. Listen to me reading Savage Reading from Rabbi in a Brothel. It's actually an interesting 10 minutes. I linked up an article with this tax bill. The GOP has finally killed family-friendly conservatism. Now, that's an odd one. It is written by a conservative, published in the liberal Washington Post. But Jonathan Copage, who wrote it, is apparently a lifetime conservative who thinks that the uh, Republican Party... Uh, has sold out the average person with the tax bill. Now, you're not going to hear that in talk radio, but I figured you have to make up your own mind, so listen to a multiplicity of voices and uh, to decide for yourself. Video. CNN promotes a children's book with a black gay married Santa Claus. Isn't that sweet? How is that for progressivism, Nancy Pelosi? Diane Feinstein, do you approve of that, a children's holiday book? That shows Santa Claus as a black, gay, married Santa Claus. If so, we know why the city is upside down and 16 ways to Sunday and how an illegal alien can shoot Kay Steinle, walk out of court laughing, and then, to make matters worse and to throw salt in the wounds, you permit the so-called defense counsel to now go back to court to try to get the one remaining charge thrown out. That's the same thing as making Santa Claus into a black, gay, married Santa Claus. The world through the eyes of the progressive is a world upside down. Speaking of San Francisco, I have another article on my website. Sea lions t are terrorizing San Francisco-based swimmers. There used to be a group of guys and women who swam over there by the um, Balclutha ship. Two of them were bitten last week by sea lions. You think they're friendly pets? They're not friendly pets. They have huge teeth. And uh, the huge teeth are made for killing things. But three swimmers were attacked by sea lions in the space of a week in the same aquatic park cove. It's right near Fisherman's Wharf. And the attacks have prompted the closure of aquatic park cove to swimmers. Much like the homeless are attacking people, now the sea lions are attacking people. But don't uh, ask the city mothers to report that. Because if they did, they'd have to admit that things are not perfect in their beautiful city. Well, that's it on the Savage Nation. Again, this is the last radio show of 2017. I'm on vacation as of tomorrow. Hope to see you in 2018. Visit me online at michaelsavage.com, where uh, there'll be fresh stories every day. Only three shopping days left to go to a bookstore and grab God, Faith, and Reason and put God under the Christmas tree. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel.